Welcome everyone, this is Jyoti Dodia. Welcome to today's session on the PowerWork webinar series. I'm really pleased to have Jesse Gorzinski here to talk about the wide world of open source with IBM I. Um, without further ado, let me hand over to Jesse. You can tell everyone a little bit about what you do and um, then kick off the session. Thank you, Jesse. All right, thank you. So, um, as mentioned, I'll start out just introducing myself. I'm from over here in Rochester, Minnesota. My job title at IBM, I, I work with the IBM Development Labs here in Rochester. My job title is business architect. I basically own, uh, in the development side, all of the open source technology happening on IBM I and, and the technologies that enable it. For instance, the, you know, the ever popular PACE environment on IBM I and, and so forth. So, um, you know, my role here is, is just to make sure that we continue to do great things with open source, which is doing great things for the platform as I'll talk about today, as well as, um, you know, just helping to lead up the, the leadership teams and, and get things done around here. So, so it's, uh, it's been a really fun ride for me and, and you'll see hopefully in today's presentation that open source technology is taking over uh, the computing world as well as the IBM I world by storm right now. So it's, it's a lot of fun technology and I hope to talk about a few of those today. I'll give you an update on, on what's going on. Um, you know, some of the latest news happening with open source on IBM I. Um, I want to start out talking a little bit about the strategy. Sometimes I save that for the end, but I'm going to start with it today. I'm going to talk about why does open source technology make sense for IBM I customers. And uh, throughout the uh, presentation today as well, I'm kind of weaving in some demo. So uh, for the demo today, just so you know, if, if you've seen, uh, you know, some of the marketing material for today's event, what I'm hoping to demo is taking a system that has absolutely no open source technology loaded onto it, at least none of the newer stuff, and load on a full open source environment, load on Node.js, load on Git, Pull down some examples from uh, public Git repository at Bitbucket, get a Node.js instance running, get some performance tools hooked up to it, and, and demo all of that uh, throughout the course of this presentation as well. And so, um, hopefully that, that leaves you with this impression that open source is, is maybe easier than you think if, if you're new to this subject. So with that being said, let's move along to uh, the opening discussion of open source and the strategy behind it. Um, a difficult topic for me to keep short sometimes because there's so much to talk about with open source and the value that it brings to the platform. Well, what I usually use to keep the conversation as grounded is the market research, right? We have various forms of market research that we gather that, that other you know, research companies gather. Uh, of course, our partners over at Help Systems do this annual survey of the IBM I community every year. And so this is a really good piece of market research as well. It's, it's very IBM I centric. And I like to zero in on, on one of these survey questions that are here throughout, uh, you know, every year they do this, which is, what are your top concerns? So if you're an IBM I shop, as you're planning the next year, the next quarter, the next project, what what are the things that are top concerns for you, the priorities for you, right? And, and you see, uh, this is the most recent year's results. Nothing in here is super surprising. But if we zero in on what's, what's up at the top, what's the top six, seven things here? Uh, you, you can actually see that in, in these top six and seven things, there's a lot of overlap with what open source technologies can bring. Right. So, of course, the number one is security. <laughs> Surprising probably to nobody on the call today. Uh, top concern for IBM I folks is security. It's the top concern for anybody in the IT industry, whether you're running IBM I or x86 or whatever you're running. Security is a top concern. And it just, uh, just so happens that open source technologies tend to implement the latest and greatest security protocols, the latest and greatest cipher suites and so on before anybody else, right? In fact, we had on IBM I, we had TLS 1.3 available before TLS 1.3 protocol was even finalized because we 
had it available in draft form. When uh, the protocol itself was actually finalized, we had that available in, in very short order for IBMI as well. So, so it can bring extra security to your IT infrastructure in a number of ways for data at rest, data in transit. Um, if we look at other things on this list as well, some of them are self-explanatory when you, when you start talking about open source, right? Modernizing your applications. Um, you know, if you're doing any kind of web technology, SOA, web services, microservices, et cetera, you're probably using open source to do so because um, almost all of those technologies that are growing, that are in use, that are stable to use are open source technology, right? Um, some of you may have seen my tweet, I think, earlier in the week about quantum computing and how I'm using open source on IBM I to hook an IBM I up to quantum computers. Right, and all of that is just made easy with open source. Right, you have the concern about skills. Um, how can we hire application developers to come do value added work for the company? Common question. And one of the answers is again, it again lies in open source because you can recruit the very best, the most skilled talent around and they're, they're likely to have some skill in some of the languages that are available on IBM I now. And obviously Java, Java is now open source. Uh, the runtime is open source. We have PHP has been around for a while, Node.js, JavaScript runtime, Python, Ruby, Lua, Perl. I mean, we have so many languages available. It's becoming very reasonable to get new application developers and have those new application developers adding value to your business right away. Couple that with what we've done with RPG and freeform RPG and, and the whole evolution there. Um, you can very easily see how people can, can get hired in, be productive right away, and also start learning your core business RPG code right away as well. Right. And other things as well, data growth. I mean, we have integration capabilities with cognitive systems and machine learning and some of the things we'll be talking about later in this session to deal with data growth. growth. We have Business intelligence and analytics, tons of open source tools there, uh, BERT tools and so on. So um, again, if we were to draw out a Venn diagram, <laughs> you would see a lot of intersection between what IBM I customers need and what open source can bring, right? So open source is a very strategic uh, thing for IBM I shops to look into and adopt. That being said, let's look at some of the customers who have done so. If you've listened to, you know, Steve Will or Allison Butterill or any of the other IBMI speakers lately, you've probably heard of this particular case study of Jory, which is a Belgian furniture maker. And they make furniture that costs more than my car, as I often joke, if you see the price on this particular screen. But they, they build high-end custom furniture. And the question is, how do we customize furniture? If I'm a customer and I want a chair with a specific kind of fabric, a specific kind of armrest, a specific you know way that it, it behaves when I recline it and things like that, it was a bit of a tedious process before technology because you can imagine you know you'd have all the books with the fabrics and the books with the chair frames and the books with the bases and the polishes and everything, right? Because every chair is custom. And so they had this idea of building this 3D configurator, as they call it. So as a customer, you can just come in and say, yep, uh, I want to try this and try this. And you can actually see what things look like. You can see with almost, almost photo realism what your chair is going to look like before you click buy, right? It, it's You can imagine how this drastically improved the customer experience. You can imagine how this uh, improved the financial results of, of this offering set for the company, right? Well, what's really important here is, you know, they partnered with CD Invest, one of our partners over in that region, and they had this idea, and they approached it with this open mind to open source. And that's what's really important about this story, because they said, well, gee, we want to do this 3D modeling. And by the way, we want to do this all on IBM I, all these 3D images and things. This is all generated on IBM I. And they said, well, what industry does a whole bunch of 3D modeling? Of course, video game industry. 
So then they said, well, gee, the video game industry does 3D modeling all the time. Do they have open source packages that they use? And of course they do, right? So they hired some folks to work on this open source technology, bring that into the solution on IBMI. And now you have uh, a very cool, very productive, um, you know, high tech solution for, for this custom chair can take. And so what I like to say about this story as well is this is really fundamentally changing the capabilities of the platform. All of this open source technology is making the IBM I more capable than it ever has at any point in the past. It's just incredible. Uh, another success story that I like to talk about is from that same region, Newt Frames. I won't go into their solution as much, but they wanted an e-commerce solution they also do uh, customizations on the frame so you can get it at certain, certain colors and sizes and things. Um, and they did a lot just to kind of modernize their whole e-commerce presence. And they did it with Power Hardware and IBM I, of course, which makes a lot of sense. But the key point is if you go read this case study, you see they say their open source solution runs side by side and fully integrated with that core business system from the 1970s. So what I call that is an example of protection of investment, which we all know that's what AS400, I-Series, and IBM I have always been about, is this protection of investment. Because you have this investment, it might be years, it might be decades of old investment in, in RPG or DB2 or ILEC or COBOL, and you can continue to leverage that with open source. And that's an important part of the open source story to understand, that's, uh, again, that's, that's one of the reasons why open source is so valuable for IBMI. And we've been publishing numerous case studies lately as well, showing that you can do this, this integration, this kind of hybrid deployment, as I call it. So you can see craft systems saying, yeah, they're running the latest open source software alongside unmodified code from the 80s, right? What other platform are you going to be able to do that on? It's, it's very unique to IBMI. It's very unique to the leveraging of open source on IBMI. Fibrocree as well, they, they, they're getting uh, the full benefits of both sides. You know, the IBMI stuff, the open source stuff, they're getting some cost reductions in there. We have Winsol, CubePack, they're talking about, you know, the various languages that they can use and how open source has more technology available than it has in the past. We have uh, Immo Bonehill and Oris, and you start to see a theme with these customers that have been really successful with open source. That theme is that they're using open source to add value, again, to their core business, right? They're not saying, hey, I have, I have IBM I and I have my core business and I have all this DB2 data, and you know what, I'm gonna replace all that with some open source stack. That's not you know, particularly a venture that's going to end well for a lot of IBM I clients where you get the most value is you say, hey, I have, my core business, and it does what it does very, very well, better than probably others in your industry. And you take open source and you add it to that, that's, that's when you see some real wins. And that's what we've seen with these case studies as well. Uh, last year, you probably were aware that we had this 30th anniversary celebration throughout the year. And we had this 30th anniversary microsite with what we called customer stories, not full case studies. We asked customers to write, you know, two to three paragraph blurbs, as I call it, on how are you innovating on IBM I. And it just so happens, a number of those customers, when they say, yeah, I want to write two paragraphs or three paragraphs about how I'm innovating on IBM I, a number of those customers, uh, in fact, a majority of those customers felt it important to mention that they are using open source and that's how they're innovating on IBM I. All right, so here's some examples, Node.js, PHP, Java, throughout, throughout the mentions, right? Another page of it, right? Node.js, PHP, curl. Um, again, this is, this is how uh, a lot of companies are, are bringing IBM I into the next generation. So if you want some breadcrumbs for some of these case studies, uh, you know, I do have a blog. Feel free to go out and read this blog entry, not because the blog entry itself is great, but the the links in there. If you go read this blog, you're going to find links to various case studies, including the ones in this presentation. You're going to find uh, references to those customer stories that I mentioned as well. 
So if you just want a single link to send to somebody to say, yep, there's, there's other people using this stuff. There's other people getting wins in the industry by using open source on IBM I, you can give them this link and it should have some breadcrumbs to get them reading a number of success stories. So what is IBM I doing? More specifically, the folks who work for me uh, here in Rochester and abroad, what are we doing to help open source and to help open source on IBM I? The short answer is a lot, right? There's the stuff that everybody knows about, which is we're delivering more open source technology and we're delivering more than we ever have before. Um, and there's various things that we're doing there, right? Delivering more open source languages, more tools for both developers and system admins. We're building up this ecosystem of, of hundreds of packages. And I'll mention that, that uh, number again in a, in a few minutes, but uh, everybody kind of knows that we're doing that. But we also are very active in uh, several open source communities. In fact, we've contributed to now, I believe over a hundred different open source projects. Right. Some of those projects we're porting into IBMI, we're upstreaming the changes. Some of the projects are things that we've pretty much authored ourselves. Some of the things have nothing specific to IBMI. We're just making the open source ecosystem better because when the open source ecosystem gets a benefit, IBMI gets a benefit. Right. So uh, very, very, very cool that we're we're out doing that. We've really changed the MO of what it means to to be developing software here at IBM. And it's it's interesting to see. You know, and of course we have those key partnerships as well with Power Ruby, with with uh, Zen, now Rogue Wave, now Perforce. Um, and so we we have a lot of stuff that we're doing. Now, some of you may have been aware of the 5733 OPS installable product for IBM I. So I do want to briefly cover the roadmap there. So here we have 5733 OPS and there it goes. 5733 OPS is very quickly on its way out. And I'll talk about why in just a couple minutes, uh, but be aware if you have started using open source on IBM I, if you're planning on using open source on IBM I, please be aware at no point should you be doing a restore lick pigum to get the open source stack, uh, at least not the stack from IBM. Right. So if you go out to our various planning pages, we've documented end of life for some of those uh, product options within OPS. So several of them are already dead. Several of them are, are dying soon. And Pretty much everything is is end of life, the end of 2019. Right? So, so again, don't be using OPS. It's not needed. It's not recommended, uh, to be frank. So, at this point, I'm going to hop over to start demo. Right? We don't install software. Oh, accidentally pressed the wrong button. So we don't install software via license program anymore. So how do we do it? And for some of you on the phone, I'm hoping this is this is a review of, of something you've already done, but how do I get this software? The first thing to understand is that this software is, um, it's not behind any kind of IBM I entitlement or licensing. It's all just governed by open source licenses. It's freely available to anybody as a web download. And we put capability in the Access Client Solutions product as well. I apologize, this is probably coming through a little small on the shared screen, but uh, hopefully you can kind of get the gist of, of what I'm doing. But up in the tools menu for ACS, there's a tool called Open Source Package Management. And so I'm just gonna launch him. I'm gonna connect to my system and then my user ID, my password, And the important thing to know is, is this system that I'm connecting to right now, it doesn't have any open source on it. It doesn't have Node.js, it doesn't have Bash, it doesn't have anything on it right now in terms of open source, except for the SSH server that I'm connecting to, uh, which is of course 5733SC1. That's the only open source on this machine right now. And so I'm gonna connect to it with this open source package management tool in ACS and I just put in my user ID, my password, click OK. And you know, I say this death by demo, the system was up 
you know, a couple minutes ago. Um, and, and of course, death by demo happens, right? <laughs> um, let me just see if this guy's up at all. So, so that was like the first part of, of my. It's always the way, isn't it? Live demos, it's all, children, it's always and animals. The way. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, while whilst you're doing that, let me remind people that you can um, ask your questions via the chat window. So click on the yep. speech bubble um, icon and uh, put in your question at the bottom. Just uh, we will be taking them at the end probably. So if you just uh, refer to the topic that you want to ask a question about, prefix it with that. That would be easier then when we come to it. Um, and if you've got any other comments, um, yeah, just enter them into the chat window and we'll keep an eye out yep. for that. Yeah, so so I do apologize. I don't know this system is, is completely down. I don't know if we're having a lab shortage or, or what's happening here in Rochester. So I'm going to skip the demo of this part. I have some uh, screenshots of it later on and I'll, I'll proceed with the rest of my demo on, on a different system. Again, hopefully technology permitting. Um, so, so again, I apologize for that. The, um, but I do want to talk about why this switch from, uh, you know, the traditional way of, of delivering open source with PTFs and with an installed license program is important, right? First off, it allows us to do a lot more. We're, we're using standard technology for the industry now to build open source. We're, we're, we have a CI CD system that we've built that, that automatically does builds and tests and even deployments of open source to the community. That allows us to do a lot more. And so if we were to grab the timeline of the number of open source packages that IBM has delivered, so we're not counting the great stuff that uh, Zend and PowerRuby have done. If we just look at IBM, you know, we started back in late 2014 with Node.js and it needed some dependencies, right? And over time, we've, you know, we did Python and we, we kept adding things, adding things to this toolkit. And we were up to about a few dozen open source packages with OPS over the course of a few years, which, which sounds really great until we started looking at RPMs. And the moment we did, uh, you know, what I call a closed beta with this RPM technology, the, the number of packages available overnight went from, you know, 38 or so to about 150. You know, and we are over uh, over 200 packages available now for IBM I. And so, if we were to revisit the timeline of open source and the stuff that was happening, you know, it, it all started back in 1998, right? And and we did this JT Open or IBM Toolbox for Java. Everybody on the call is likely using this. Uh, in 2002, we actually delivered Apache as uh, HTTP server as part of the operating system. You know, we did PHP a few years after that. And so you can kind of see like, yep, we were doing stuff, we were doing stuff, we were doing stuff. And then in the in the past few years, you know, Power Ruby uh, did their, their Ruby stuff in 2013. And then you can see in the past few years, IBM really started ramping up investments in open source. And 2018 was the breakthrough year. 2018 was the year that we uh, embraced this new technology that allowed us to, to deliver so much more. And it also brings various other um, benefits as well. So of course, the first one, you don't need to install 5733 OPS anymore. In fact, uh, you know, we found with OPS, we found a number of customers had issues installing it, right? And uh, it was very difficult. They didn't know how to find it on the entitled software support website, didn't know what to do with the file they downloaded, had some issues with, um, you know, various, um, you know, installing the group queues and doing IPLs and all of those things. And now, again, it, it's it's very easy. I'm, it's unfortunate the demo failed, but again, you'll see a screenshot in just a minute that'll show how easy it is to install this open source stack. And we we are in the hundreds now. We, we have a lot of stuff available. Um, I, I don't see the chat persistently, but I saw a question pop up about CI CD tools. Um, you know, we we do have various things that are in that whole CI CD suite, including you know build tool chains with uh, GNU Make and things like that. We of course have Git, we have Jenkins running, we have um, things like Ansible, which is is becoming more popular. Red Hat technology, 
Um, so we do have a lot of things in that CI CD ecosystem that, that work great on IBMI as well. Jesse, but, um, yeah. just a, another question which has come to sure. me privately, which is probably worth handling now, is sure. all, the, all the information that you've been talking about, um, I assume that applies to current releases, and then are you able to say anything about a future IBMI release? So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll say generally speaking, we what we deliver is not tied to specific releases, right? Uh, but it does require a lot of it now uses IBM i7.2. So anything 7.2 and newer, um, you know, so so that, that applies to pretty much everything that's publicly available today works on 7.2 plus. Um, I, I expect there are a few packages that are going to be coming out in the next few months that will require certain versions of newer releases, but we, we don't know for sure what that is at this point. Right. Thank you. Um, but I, I do want to talk about, before I move on, one of the other huge aspects of RPMs and YUM and why it's so significant, because we've, we've delivered now compilers that everybody can use. We've delivered um, this, these whole tool chains and ecosystems that people can use to build technologies. And so we're actually starting to now um, operate in an open source fashion. When we were delivering open source with PTFs, IBM was the only entity that could deliver anything, right? We were the only ones, practically speaking, there are, there are other companies, but practically speaking, we're the only ones who are building PTFs. We're the only ones who know how. Um, Again, there are exceptions to that, but generally speaking, we're, we're the ones delivering. Um, customers want an update for something. Customers want to submit an issue for something. IBM was the only entity even capable of handling any of those requests. That's not how open source has ever been successful in any, any industry. That's not how it works. We have now, again, embraced standard technologies across that's in use by you know, several flavors of Linux, particularly the Red Hat derived Linuxes for building and distributing this open source technology. So we, can, we can deliver stuff, but you can also get support from the community for these packages now. You couldn't before with PTS because communities can, can give a patch and someone could actually build it. And um, you, know, you, can, you can do a lot now in the community. We actually have software available from third parties as well, and we'll talk about that later on. So this is a screenshot of what I was hoping to demo on my system that went down sometime between you know five minutes before the presentation and now, <laughs> uh, which is how, how it always goes. But when you go to connect to a system, so here's uh, you know an example. I'm connecting to a system. It doesn't have any open source on it at all. This is what you get. You get a message that says open source environment not installed. Would you like to install it now? And you just go ahead and you click yes. You wait about you know four or five minutes, and you're done. Okay. And it, by the way, this step doesn't require uh, you know internet access from your IBM I. It doesn't really require it doesn't require any form of IBM I licensing, any form of IBM I entitlements, serial number validation. Doesn't require anything because when you click yes on this box and say yes, I want to install an open source environment. The ACS tool is actually going out to an HTTPS location, that's an IBM.com site, downloading the packages for you and using the SSH connection to your IBM I to send these packages to IBM I. And so when that's done, you will have a set of packages installed. We call that the bootstrap, um, which is just um, the RPM capabilities, the package manager capabilities. The package manager is what allows you to list what's available. Um, you know, install upgrades, uh, all that kind of stuff. All of that gets loaded on just with, with that initial install. And from there, it's very, very simple to, um, you know, add more stuff. Right? One of the things that get installed with this bootstrap is this command line tool called YUM. And if you've been following my blog or my Twitter, you've probably heard a lot of mentions of YUM last year. YUM is what makes this all super, super simple. With YUM, you can uh, do everything on this list, right? This is typical sysadmin stuff. You can install and remove packages. You can check versions, check for CV, and all that stuff with, with just uh, pretty simple commands. We'll, and we'll talk about 
in a few minutes how you deal with some of this stuff if you don't have internet access from your IBMI. Because once you load on this initial package, like I said, that doesn't require uh, any internet access from your IBMI at all. It just requires a laptop that's connectable to both the internet and the IBMI. Once, once that initial package is on, then, then this yum command line tool is going to want to talk to these, what we call an RPM repository, straight from your IBMI. So it will want some outbound internet access there, but there are ways around that, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But here's an example. There's uh, this yum command. If you can, if this is coming through okay in the WebEx, you, you just type a command yum install, and you can give it a package name, and it says okay, yep, nginx. By the way, pretty powerful HTTP server, great for you know adding security to your web applications, adding performance to your web applications. Uh, it says, yep, I'm going to install him. He's 1.2 megs, by the way, and by the way, he also needs the new OpenSSL security library. So he hunts down all your dependencies for you. You just say, yes, this is okay. And, and the install of this guy takes less than a minute. So at this point, um, I'm going to hop back to demo. I'm going to assume that my um, initial system here is still down for whatever reason, <laughs> which is beautiful. Let me just close this out. I'm going to hop to one of our other development systems that already had some of this installed. So I'm going to apologize for that. Uh, you get to hear my typing for a minute. So once you get through that whole, you know, I'll load this on for you. Again, you you get all of this stuff. Yeah, you know, initially I think there's something like 45 packages that would be installed. So if I were demoing on the system that is down right now <laughs> there would be about 45 things on this list because this is a development system it already has a bunch of things um, but for the demo today i wanted to say well i'm going to pull code from bitbucket so i need git right um, and oh look we have we have git he's already installed so you see the three tabs here and i apologize this might not be coming through the best on the webex but this interface has three tabs and lists installed packages available packages so packages that you don't have installed yet but are available from the ibm rpm repository and a tab for updates available so you know you know right away if there's updates to any of the packages that you have right and so uh, node.js 10 in fact for this particular system that i'm on uh, you can see everything that i need for today's demo is already there but if there was something else that I needed, I could just come over to available packages here and say, oh, I need, I need these couple things. Select what you need, click on install, and it, it does that same thing. All the ACS tool is doing is it's, it's running this yum package manager for you. And so it says, here's what I'm gonna install. It asks if it's okay. It'll download the package, it'll install the package. And you can see, sometimes you get uh, some warnings coming out of them but you can see it's quick right a lot of the stuff that you can do here is quick lftp is a very robust uh, ftp client you want to go install him sure right i'll go download install boom in seconds i can install a lot of these packages right for some of the bigger ones it takes a little longer you know node.js you have to download 20 megs so you're talking you know 90 seconds of your day <laughs> right um and so that, that's what's important for you to understand is, is that installing packages, getting open source installed on your system, even for the first time, is incredibly simple. And, and again, for the, I, I do apologize for my demo system being down at a very inconvenient time. Um, so, so let's come back and talk about languages, because that's what I'm going to demo really is this uh, Node.js application. And you know, people often ask, you know, hey, we're delivering all this open source stuff. IBM and now the community is delivering all this open source technology. And there's, you know, hundreds of packages available. What's the most significant stuff in there? And without a doubt, the most significant thing are the new programming languages that we deliver. Because when you deliver a new programming language, you allow, you know, a whole new class of applications to run on the system. You enable a whole new group of developers that are able to be application developers and be contributing to your business in a very short term, like I mentioned earlier, whether they're new hires or people from 
other parts of your organization or whatever, right? And so you have this this new applications, new programmers, new solutions that are you know either turnkey and available or that can be built in, in a rather short amount of time quite uh, quite often. So languages, programming languages are a really important part of uh, what we do and and definitely the most important packages that we deliver. So what are we doing uh, with languages? Of course, we have a long-standing partnership with RogueWave Technologies. Uh, they delivered Zen Server while well, they were Zen back in the day, but they delivered Zen Server for IBM I. That, of course, brought PHP technology as well as all the value-added stuff that Zen Server can bring. They, they now have Z-Ray. They have a, a number of performance and monitoring tools and things as part of Zen Server on top of just PHP. Right, so that was very successful. PHP has been on the system for, uh, you know, since 2006, so over a decade, you know, 12, 12 years, almost 13 years, we've had PHP on the system. That means it is a tried and true, it is a well-established technology for IBM. We have numerous customers that have been using PHP with success. We have, uh, you know, if you regularly go to events like Common US, I mean, you're you're going to see PHP on the curriculum every year. It's been on the curriculum every year um, in pretty good numbers for a decade, right? It's, uh, if you will, the granddaddy of open source languages on IBM I. So um, we have we have a lot of cool stuff happening there, and again, a lot of a lot of people successfully adopting PHP. We also partnered with Power Ruby, and again, this is back in 2013. They released Power Ruby um, Community Edition for IBM I. They also have, as of just a couple months ago, they just released Power Ruby CE2, which is Community Edition 2. So it's it's free for you to try, evaluate, use. You can get premium support from Power Ruby as well uh, for this offering. But but this is how we have Ruby on IBM I. We also have Ruby on Rails on IBM I. We have Python on IBM I, which is, some of you know that I have I have a thing for Python. I really love Python as a language. It's uh, what people would consider a general purpose language. It's very easy to learn, very easy to use. And in fact, this is the only programming language that when I was learning the language, I was having fun. My first day in my life programming in Python, I was having fun. Right. I was out talking to Amazon. I was out talking to eBay. I was out talking to Twitter. I, I was doing all this cool stuff and it wasn't a lot of code and it wasn't painful. And I was doing it all from the IBM I and I was having fun doing it. It was just such a great experience for me. But that's what Python aims to be. Python aims to be this programming language that's easy to learn that gets you where you need to go without a lot of pain. Right. Um, you know, one thing we've been telling people is it's the CL language for the modern programmer, right? I'm not a fan of CL um, and uh, Python, you know, Python can in some cases do what CL did and it can do it a lot easier. So for that reason, IBM I people have looked at Python, um, but a lot of IBM I folks in particular have looked at Python because it's this easy to learn language. It's um, you know, you can you can be an RPG de developer, an ILEC developer, you can be a COBOL developer. You can learn Python. It's easy. It's it's fun, and and you can use Python then to extend your business and and meet new business requirements, do cool new innovative things, some of the stuff that we're talking about later. And some of you may know that the name of Python didn't come from the snake. It came from Monty Python. And there's two reasons for that. Reason one is, of course, the guy who invented Python was a big fan of Monty Python. I am as well, by the way. Um, but the second reason was, again, that programming should be fun and that Monty Python is fun. So that's that's where Python got its name. Another, of course, big hitter now that's new is, is Node.js. Node.js is the server-side runtime for the JavaScript language. It's uh, great for web. Its roots are in the web, actually, because they, the people who created Node realized that Google Chrome made this V8 engine, which knows how to compile JavaScript into machine code and run it super duper fast. 
and they said, well, wait a second, we can now have the same code on the back end as the, as the front end. And so you can have JavaScript on both sides of the pipe, which is a huge development time saver. Um, in fact, there are several case studies on that as well to show that using JavaScript on both the front end and the back end does save a lot of development cost. The performance is great. It's highly scalable. It's very good at handling concurrent connections. It has tons of investment right now from very large companies, including, you know, Joyent, IBM, uh, PayPal, Netflix, Google, uh, many large companies, a lot of investment. It's growing like wildfire. Uh, it's, it's definitely something to keep an eye on. Uh, IBM is, is highly involved in Node.js. We, of course, have a multi-million dollar investment in Node.js. We've done tons with the debugability, the enterprise readiness of Node.js. And so Node.js really is a force to be reckoned with right now. Again, it's just experiencing uh, incredible growth and, and it's great at handling these massive web workloads, right? You know, so think about if you're PayPal or Netflix, how many how many times or how many requests per second are you getting with people, you know, adding movies to their playlist, rating movies, writing reviews for movies, streaming movies, et cetera. Um, you need something that performs well with a lighter footprint that that's good for those types of workloads. And Node.js fits that bill. Very large companies are using Node.js. Walmart uses Node.js. In 2013, Walmart transitioned all of their um, mobile workloads for Black Friday to these systems that had something like 10 CPU and 28 gigs of RAM, right? It's not a huge room of servers. Node.js is great at handling these very large web workloads. So again, you, op you utilize open source because of the surrounding ecosystem. And there's all these modules available to you in open source. Um, you know, if you're using the Python language, there's 125,000 and counting. Node.js, again, is, is going very, very rapidly, uh, 700,000. Node.js packages are available in this Node.js package repository called npm.js. Um, so we're again just seeing incredible growth. But what's IBM I doing? What else are we doing besides those languages? Well, the integration of those languages. Again, think about those case studies that I mentioned earlier. Why did open source bring value to those companies? It brought value to those companies because those companies used open source alongside their core business, which was, you know, this DB2 investment, RPG investment, you know, whatever investment they, that they have using IBM I technologies. So every time we deliver a major language, we deliver some level of integration so that you can integrate with the database, you can integrate with, with RPG and so on. Even in the core operating system, we've delivered things in um, core operating system, stuff like DB2 to allow easier interaction with open source technologies. And one example of that is IBM I services, right? And some of you are familiar with IBM I services, which means from simple SQL, from anywhere you get a database context, which easily includes open source code now, you can query stuff about the system, set stuff about the system with simple SQL, right? So here's an example of, you know, one of my favorite query, querying out network activity. You can query out, you know, how full are my disks? Here I have seven disk units. They're all, you know, 28 to 30% full. Simple SQL. So, so we do that um, because, again, that integration of open source with your core business is a key part of the value proposition for open source. Other stuff that we're doing as well are delivering all of these tools. And um, one of the things that we're aiming to do when we deliver these, these vast tool sets is what we call this normalization of IBM I, right? And what do we mean by that? It means that if you're a developer and you're writing code on IBM I, you can do so with standard tools, tools that you know. Um, there are, um, you know, millions of college grads out there who understand how to use the tools that people are using with IBM I today. Right? We're talking modern editors that are all working, modern protocols that are all working. And so more and more often now we're hearing people that say, yeah, I have developers writing code on IBM I. They, they have never seen a green screen, right? In fact, my developers, they very, very rarely look at a 5250 session. 
you know, they do a lot of their work through SSH. They use, um, you know, SSHFS. They access the file system via other ways. They're using Visual Studio Code primarily to write code. They're using the same modern tools that they they learned in college for some of them, right? So, so that's very important. We're just using standard tools. Now, uh, <laughs> haven't haven't dry run this. Let's hope my demo works. So again. Um, my my primary system that I was hoping to demo not up, so I'm going to hop over to one of our development systems. So this is you know odds of success. I don't even have a system configuration for this one. Odds of, of success are a little bit marginalized, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, depends how much my team is uh, playing around on this one. Oh, I already have him. Sorry. Everybody's looking, so that means I do stupid things uh, right here. So I am going to make a directory for you guys, cd into it. I'm going to make the text a little bigger here, or a lot bigger, so you can actually see it, what I'm doing. So. Again, how I primarily access the system when I'm working with open source stuff, how I recommend anybody access the system is through an SSH terminal. Do not use Q shell. And I, you know, if, if I'm dead someday and you wanna see me roll in my grave, just walk by my grave and say that you're using Q shell. <laughs> You'll see an angry corpse or something. Um, but don't use Q shell if you're using open source stuff. It does not work well. Some things still work, but, um, you know, they don't work quite right. Um, it's it's just not something that I recommend. So uh, let me find my. Got to find the project that I'm going to pull down here. So I'm going to actually pull down one of the sample projects that, that one of my team members made for, for Node.js. And it's part of this repository that has a bunch of Node.js examples in it. There's examples here about how to do, you know, connection pooling and how to use Koa and Restify and Happy and various frameworks. We're working to move all these into GitHub and get some some better front ends on it and things. But if you're on Git, uh, GitHub, if you're on Bitbucket, there's almost always a clone button. It'll actually give you the command that you need to run and since we have Git on IBM I, I can just paste that command right in and you can clone a project and you can start working on a project. If you're familiar with Git, you know the first, um, the first step is always a clone. In this case, we have a branch just for the demo today called demo. So there's an option that I'm gonna say, I'm gonna clone down that branch. Um, and of course, because I'm not on the system that I had prepared, I don't have SSH keys set up. So I'm going to do a Git clone of just that URL. So I'm just going to use HTTPS. And again, I apologize for the death, death by demo here. Um, yeah. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to hop over to a different system. And again, sorry, sorry for this. Like I said, I had a system with SSH keys set up and, and everything was working and it was connectable till, till right before. Um, I'm going to, again, step into this. There we go. It's actually working now. I uh, apologize for the 10 minutes I wasted there. Um, now we just have, should have had a backup system ready. But he's going to go out, clone everything down. So he's just out sucking everything down from this public Git repository now. And he's going to put this in into a little Node.js examples directory. And, and that's it. Um, this particular project is a Node.js project, um, but 
To make the demo a little more complicated, I'm going to be using some performance metrics analysis with the demo today. And so this project does come with uh, a, a nice hunk of native C code that does need to be compiled and things. So um, there's a, just a couple extra steps related to getting that compiled and built and and uh, we'll, we'll go from there. This particular system has, has some IO issues right now, so it's slow. Um, my demos haven't been going well today. We're gonna let him just chug along for a minute. because so I'm gonna talk again about um, a, that notion of standard tools, right? We had Eclipse Orion um, delivered in OPS. We can um, deliver it in RPM form if we wanted to, but people are running it with the technologies that we have. We have standard tools, NPM, Visual Studio Code, terminal-based debuggers. Again, a lot of stuff that people are using uh, in the industry are working on IBM I. And that's, that's uh, exactly um, what's going on. So, um, we, uh, Bill sent me a chat as well. So I'm gonna I'm gonna multitask here. I'm gonna try to hop back over to our OSS 7.2 box. Um, While Jesse is doing that, um, just a quick reminder that you can put your questions into the chat window, and we'll take them at the end. Um, there's been some. Uh, I'm going to capture some of the links of uh, things that Jesse has mentioned. If they're not in the presentation already, yeah. I'll include them in, yeah. in the wiki. Niels, thank you for pointing out the, the very obvious workaround for my HTTP SSL verify. Should have just gone there first. Um, so we got this Node.js examples directory. Um, oops. And there's a simple little express application in here. And um, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to say npm install on this guy. So when you get a Node.js application, it has this package.json file, which if you can see here in my current directory, and that lists everything that the package needs to run. And so when I go ahead and say uh, npm install, that's using the Node package manager, and it's going to go out and fetch everything that this package needs to run. And if needed, it'll actually go build the package for you. And that's actually what's going to happen here. So I'm going to let him run in the background. Sorry for the rocky demo with my, uh, my demo system. And thanks, Niels, for, for pinging that in the chat. Um, but I want to talk about some of the other uh, news that's been going along or that's been happening lately with open source on IBM I. Um, one of the bigger ones, .NET is available on IBM I. This is huge for IBM I. We have so many shops using .NET in uh, Windows environments to talk to IBM I. And we have, therefore, uh, you know, tons of IBM I shops that have .NET skills. And now that we have, again, this community enablement in our technology, this ability so that anybody can start building this stuff, distributing this stuff, we have Mono available on IBM I because of this community effort. Uh, driven by some real geniuses in the community. Some of you may know them. You can go chat with them out on, on River, and I'll have some links for that later on. But it's just out there. It's in this third-party repository. So it's not from RP, uh, from IBM, but it's, it's from uh, this third party. We have verified that the RPMs are built in a sane way and, and things like that. And you can go install any of these mono packages now. There's data packages, there's mono core, all of these things you can just install by simple commands like I demoed earlier when I was installing um, some of the other stuff that I showed you. So, so very simple to install. Some of the other cool, exciting news happening with IBM I and open source right now is machine learning, right? So we have uh, via RPMs for some of these packages, we have Python packages now that do various data science, data processing, and machine learning on IBM I. And so you can see some of them listed on this slide. We can do visualizations, we can do um, statistical analysis, we can build a model, we can learn from a model. So we can do a lot of stuff. In fact, if you follow the IBM data science account on Twitter, they sometimes talk about these courses that you can go take for free. In fact, this is a screenshot of a particularly interesting course. Um, you know, you get to go learn about NumPy, Pandas, SciPy, SciKit, Learn, 
That might not mean a lot to you if you're not familiar with Python and those particular packages, but you can go take the course. You can learn about this stuff. And by the way, all of these technologies you can do, use on IBMI. All of those packages are, are working great on IBMI today. So if you're interested in machine learning, you can check that out. So some people kind of, you know, you'll naturally ask about the positioning of these machine learning technologies. We have these Python libraries that are there. We have Watson. Uh, we have Power AI. Oh my, there are a lot of options for you uh, when it comes to using cognitive computing and AI from your IBM I system. Because we have, of course, this IBM Power AI offering, which is essentially uh, a hardware stack and a software stack built from the ground up with the uh, with the specialization of AI and machine learning, right? So Power AI, for instance, has a lot of GPUs because they exploit the GPU support to do that, that learning portion of machine learning and so on. So, so it is very powerful. Like I said, it's built from the ground up for machine learning and AI. We of course have IBM Watson, which is a cloud-based solution, which is uh, you know, we're up, I think we are up to like 58 distinct cognitive capabilities that you can access either from your IBMI via APIs or you can send up your data from IBMI and have it analyze and get insights from your data that way. So we're going to do a side by side of a few of those. I'm not going to walk through this whole table, but you can see, you know, between Watson, Power AI, and what you can do on IBMI now. They all have their own advantages and they all uh, have different use cases perhaps, right? So uh, the Python libraries might be a really great on-ramp for you because it's freely available. Uh, it's not, not just a trial version or anything. It's just completely free, no questions asked, easy to install. Again, you can have all this installed in you know three minutes or less. I'm not, not exaggerating here. Um, you can just run it right there on your IBM I. You have direct access to your IBM I DB2 data thanks to our uh, data connectors that I talked about earlier. Uh, so, so it might be a really, really good way for you to get started with machine learning, right? I'll talk about machine learning again in a few minutes, and I'm going to show you some examples uh, time permitting. So, looking back over on this build that I had kicked off, it looks like everything actually built successfully. So. Um, Looks like it added 264 Node.js packages in in that time, and it it only took a few minutes of chugging along in the background there. So uh, that looks good. So we'll circle back and finish up that demo as well. Hopefully, the end of the demo is less rocky than the start of the demo. But before I get there, I do want to talk about this uh, significant development in open source as well, which is what does support look like with open source? Right. And in the past, we had 5733 OPS. OPS was not supported. Right. Uh, if you read the support statement for OPS, it said and continues to say this is as is software with no express or implied support. Use at your own risk, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Um, the exception there was Node.js because you could actually get support from the IBM cloud teams for Node.js on IBM I. Um, the RPM file, as I call it, this stack of 200 RPMs, you can get community support for um, because you can go out to these communities and you can submit an issue and say, hey, this doesn't work on IBM I. And you just darn well might get fixes for it. In fact, it might circle back around to my team who will help you get fixes for it through the community. And that is a model that, that does work very well. And now with RPMs, you can exploit community support, which is a fantastic thing. Um, we do actually go ahead and support those in integration pieces that I mentioned earlier, the database connectors, the toolkits to talk to RPG and so on. So we do have support for those. If you're using Power Ruby, Zen Server, some of the other stuff, you know, you might have uh, various ERP packages where you can get support from the software provider, right? So you have that support today, right? Most open source frameworks, other stuff, you know, a lot of what we have now is community support is available. So what's new is that we have IBM technology support services able to provide support for open source on IBM I as well. Uh, what they offer is a very comprehensive 
support solution. They they do support for System Z, Power, Intel. I think 30,000 different IT devices is what they claim. Um, they they have a 99% fix rate in the Linux world, as you can see on here. But they support various things in Linux space. They support some commercial open source packages. Uh, important for IBM I, they can support some of this community open source stuff that we've delivered for IBM I. So this is very significant. Um, you can get 24-7 support. You can get 9 by 5 support at a little bit of a lower price tag if you want. You get uh, uh, very large teams of people skilled in open source technologies. And, um, you know, skilled in IBM I as well. In fact, you can see for some of the work, we subcontract out to Rogue Wave Software to do some of the level three support, as we call it, the more advanced support. They, of course, have been working with IBM I for 12 years. Those are the people that delivered Zen Server and PHP for IBM I. So, so this isn't a brand new offering. Um, Technology Support Services has been supporting open source and IT infrastructures for a very long time, but is now new to IBM I. This is a pretty significant development to show that open source on IBM I is ready for business. It is ready for um, you know the enterprise. It's ready to power whatever your business needs it to power, right? They have a supported product list of about 100 things and growing, and so a number of those things, of course, are very important for IBMI folks. We'll talk about some notables in a minute, but I also want to mention that this isn't just break-fix, right? Very often we think of support as something broke, I need it fixed, right? And when you need something fixed, then you pick up the phone, then you, you know, go online, submit a ticket, whatever. Um, this support offering is more than that. It's it's about really helping you throughout your software development life cycle. Yes, it does break fix, but it also does some of the other things listed on on this particular slide. Right? They help with configuration issues and some some uh, you know short duration guidance as we as we call it. Um, and so um, again, worth checking out. Open source is ready for the enterprise. If you're running IBM I, there's, there's some significant stuff that's a part of this support offering now. Node.js, Python, a lot of IBM I folks using WordPress, Apache Tomcat, Jenkins, Git, right? Those things can all be supported now on IBM I. And again, here's a link to my blog post as well, so feel free to go read a little bit more about that. And of course, it's due for you is, is come join the community. We have uh, the best place is probably out on this social media platform called River. So you need to go to that first link there to sign up, and then you can come chat us up, and and you'll get open source on I experts over there, right? Uh, various other places as well, including Twitter. You can follow the IBM IOSS hashtag. You can follow me. Um, you can hear about the latest stuff that I'm dabbling with, and and so on, right? If you're a blog writer, if you speak at user groups, if you speak to colleagues and friends, <laughs> spread the word about open source. Okay. Um, so that, that being said, um, you know, I call this the appendix. I want to briefly walk through a couple, you know, for the sake of time, a few examples of machine learning technology. Everything I'm about to show you, all the screenshots are taken from IBM I. Right, so here we have, it's, it's a fictional workload whose CPU usage is kind of bouncing around but growing over time. And the system admin needs to figure out how long until this is a concern. And so how long until I'm averaging about 40% CPU usage for this application because this is good, the CPU usage keeps growing. You can use um, linear regressions to solve the problem or you can use machine learning to solve the problem. And they both come up with pretty similar results. It's this. You can just use um, a model that you built up. You can use um, simple geometry as well. Of course, machine learning gets the advantage when there's more complex trends involved. Maybe there's a seasonal cycle for something, whether it's sales or advertising budgets or whatever, right? Um, machine learning, you can build up a model and it will learn your business. And that's where the power is with machine learning. And of course, another in industry really interested in machine learning right now is banking because they need to figure out the risk factors for things, right? Not only in investments they're making, but people applying for loans, people applying for credit extensions. And so a lot of uh, banks and other financial institutions are interested in building up uh, a model that they can then learn from. 
and um, you know, one of the teams here in Rochester, this is actually a team of, of a bunch of uh, interns. Well, not a bunch, I think uh, three or four interns uh, built up a demo this summer about uh, how, to, how to do credit default protection. And so they were given a data set of all of these, these fictional borrowers and an, it's anonymized data, but it talked about, you know, all these various attributes of these borrowers and, and what they were able to do is they were able to say, well, let's train a model with 90% of the results. So what, what they did is they had what they call a ground truth, right? So they knew here's, here's all these people, some people defaulted, some people didn't, and they have all these attributes about the people. And so they, they had a thousand of these known bits of information. So what they did is they used 900 of those credit accounts to train a model. And then they tested the model on the last 100 to see, can this model predict if somebody is going to default, right? And so they, they had pretty good success doing that, in fact. And the more data they would be able to feed it, the better the model would get at predicting things. And so they trained a model and then they were able to go ask the model who's likely to default. And if you see over on the right, you know, some people are green, not likely to default. Some people are yellow, which means they might default. And then there's some red that say, yeah, you're, you're gonna default. This person's not gonna pay you back kind of thing. Right. Um, and then, of course, they built up a web form around it as well. So, uh, you know, it, this is very similar to if you're applying for a credit card or a loan online, this is the type of stuff that's happening now where you can put in all this information about yourself. And, and uh, you know, in this example, they just tell you how likely you are to default. But in real life, that would be, uh, you know, you're declined for this line of credit or whatever it is. Right. Um, so they built up a web form that, that does these predictions based on that model, right? Um, so I'll skip over that. But also with, with this, these Python packages, we can do classifications, right? So what we're looking at in this particular screenshot or set of screenshots is, you know, we have data sets and we have all of these, these various attributes for members of the data set. And what it's doing is it's is it's figuring out these lines, the dotted lines that you see are the lines that the, the model is determining to use for classifying future members, right? Future members of the data set as they come in, it uses these lines that it's trained itself on to figure out what class of person they belong in, right? And so you can imagine um, this type of technology is in use for figuring out what kind of ads to deliver to you or what, what kind of market segments a certain business falls in and so on and so forth, right? And of course, if you wanna get rich, you just use machine learning to go figure out the stock market, which is what we're doing here. Um, again, these all of these screenshots, these are all taken from uh, an IBMI actually, um, but what this particular sample is doing is it's trying to figure out clusters. So closely related businesses in the stock market. In other words, businesses that tend to uh, behave similarly, right? And you can see it kind of came up with these clusters up in the upper right of, of oil companies, Chevron, ConocoPhillips, and Valero. Um, and it was able to figure out the types of relationships between all these various companies so that it has a better idea of how um, things impact a company when it impacts a certain industry and, and things along those lines. So uh, I guarantee that uh, if you have somebody managing your 401k account in the U.S. or you have someone managing your stocks and your finances, I guarantee that they're looking at or are using this type of technology, right? Other things you can do with machine learning, things that you've heard about, right? Facial recognition. You know, we trained a model based on faces of uh, famous political figures. Right, and we were able to then use that model to recognize future pictures of those people, right? And um, you can see over on the right, yeah, we've edited a picture of Bush, and it was able to figure out yeah, this is George W. Bush, and so on. And it actually got all of these right, except I think one where um, it got got a little mixed up there. But the more data you feed a model, the better the model gets. Right. So it's really cool technology. A lot of these. Uh, facial recognition models are built on this, this concept of eigenfaces. If you're bored someday, go look into these and you're going to see some really cool stuff. But, um, you know, this is the same type of technology that every uh, industry leading 
facial recognition solution is using, and we're using it on IBMI. And that's one of the key pieces to know about this whole story is that the latest and greatest stuff that the industry is using, that the world is using, we can exploit from IBMI with the data that's on IBMI, right? Whether whether we want to talk about cognitive computing, we can do that. Whether we want to talk about quantum computing, we can do that. Facial recognition, machine learning, we can do all of those things from IBMI. So that being said, let's let's do something rather basic. I have a Node.js CRUD application here, and I'm going to go ahead and, and start him up. And let's hope everything's working out. Yep, it's like uh, 1883. Got to remember now what what system I'm on. Um, actually, I switch the port on this guy. Over 10, yeah. Oh. Go back. This is not working well at all, is it? Oh, server's listing on port 4000. Okay, I read that wrong. There we go. <laughs> um, so this is just a simple little CRUD application. It's, as you can see, it's uh, just a couple tables of books and it says log in to manage books. I can log in. This is, by the way, this is just going to be my IBMI user ID and password. And I can log in and now when I log in, I have this button, I can add a new book. So I can add a book about um, you know, this, user group and add an is been and it's you know 45 74 and boom I click add now we have a new table right here's my new book that I added um, I can go home I can can come in manage books and and delete books whatever right so this is a simple little crud application with node.js and um, you know it's it is what it is it's it's a pretty cool little application just to get rolling if if you're new to Node.js, it's a great example just to use as a starting point. Maybe you need to write a CRUD app. You need to know how to talk to the database and so on. It is a pretty cool example. But I mentioned before, there's this thing called app metrics. And this visualization of app metrics called app metrics dash. And I wanted to demo that today. And I was hoping to demo it on a system that had no open source at the beginning of the session. But unfortunately, that didn't work out. But we have this dashboard. And he's out here and he's he's figuring out, um, you know, performance stuff. He's tracking CPU usage, which is going to be pretty much around zero. Uh, Node.js loop times. Uh, this is basically a single loop that handles all these Node.js requests. And he's going to just kind of keep track of performance. And if I come in and I lean on refresh and do a bunch of stuff, uh, maybe we see a little tick in CPU, probably not. You can see it tracks HTTP throughput. Got a little tiny bump in CPU if you saw that. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and, um, you know, he gives a summary as well. So you can see all the various places that people hit. You can see I went, I added one book. So you can see there was one hit to this add book endpoint and things. So it's keeping an eye on my web application. As you can see, everything right now is it's running pretty smoothly, right? The heap kind of grew a little bit, and then it went back down as I was leaning on F5. And everything, it's just it's just running pretty smoothly right now. Loop times are quick and so on. Um, but I'm going to go into Node.js examples. And I'm going to make this a little bigger as well for you. This particular application also serves up some APIs. And so I'm going to pretend that somebody's coming in and talking to an API, and it's not, uh, not good. So demo.sh, localhost, 
I was on port 4000, if I recall correctly. So I'm going to be clicking around here. And oh, look, if you can see this, my browser right now is spinning. My application is not responding at the moment. I just wanted to go back to the home page and it's not responding. What's going on? Right. And then now it just kind of popped through. Right. So I want to go back and say manage books. Oh, it's not responding. Right. It, it, it'll go eventually. But if I come back and look at my my running app metrics things, um, you can see, oh, look, I, I got something interesting going on. I got a spike in the heat. I got a spike in CPU. Uh, you know, I can see loop times going up. You can see activity kind of going across the board. There's a lot of good stuff you can find from these graphs, right, by the way. I just don't have time to go through them all. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and say, if you're in this situation, you say, gee, how do I figure out what is, um, what's going on here, right? Well, one of the things you can do is you can actually turn on profiling. And so I'm going to turn on profiling. And that comes, uh, if you go to this profiling section, it's going to create this thing called a flame graph. I'm not sure if anybody here is familiar with the flame graph, but it is, um, not chronological. What it's designed to do is show you all these call stacks, so all these things stacked on top of each other. This is actually the call stacks for the application, as you know a call stack to be. And now the width of each of these columns represents how much CPU time is spent in that particular call stack. And so the, the takeaway here is that something, again, something is bad, something's going on. Like I said, this application serving up an API and I'm actually hitting it with this little script over here. But something's going on, what's going on? Well, if I wanna know, if I look at this flame graph, what this means here is whatever is going on right here at the top of this tower, that's taking up you know, about 90% of the time. And so it's very, very easy to see if I click on it, as you, you saw me when I click on any of these cells, over there, here's the call stack. So in very short order, here's the call stack that's in use 90% of the time that I'm running. And it just so happens what, what this application has, it has an API that it's serving up that generates prime numbers, right? And so the prime numbers are, um, you know, it's just an API for that, but what is my script doing? He's asking for all the prime numbers between uh, one and some outrageous number like 10 million, right? So um, that's what happens here is that we are in the middle of uh, generating these prime numbers and it's doing bad things to the applications. And now that I stop doing that, now my application is snappy again. I can go back, edit books and so on, right? This book price just went up by a dollar, save him. And again, it's a nice little application you can get rolling, right? And I know we have a number of questions. Like I said, when I'm presenting, I can see a couple of them, but a lot of them we're, we're going to come back to in just a couple minutes. Um, I'm going to finish with a couple minutes of closing, closing thoughts, and then we'll have 10 minutes or so for, for questions on this guy. Um, again, I do have a blog. I have about four or five readers. I'd love to have seven or eight. So um, feel free to go read read my blog about the latest stuff happening with IBMI or latest, latest ramblings of, of the month uh, in my head. One of the key points of this presentation and, and the whole phenomenon is in general is that we are in the midst of an open source revolution on IBMI. And in fact, we're just at the start of this revolution. We have so many more technologies that you can leverage on the platform now so many more ways to integrate those technologies with your IBMI data. It's this true explosion of technology. The, the, you know, we have so many languages available on IBMI. We have several languages that also will be available shortly. Um, we have application development normalizing, as I mentioned earlier. You can pretty much take anybody who's an application developer and they can be writing applications for IBMI. We have so many more tools, frameworks, solutions, right? The, the capabilities of what we have are, are just 
again, unprecedented. We've never had these kinds of capabilities before. Open source is truly changing the face of the platform. It is revolutionizing IBM I. And, um, you know, it, it's an incredibly exciting thing to be taking part of. And I hope, um, you know, everybody on this call either is already taking part in the revolution or will be taking part in the revolution. Because in the future, you're going to be looking back. And, and in my opinion, you'll be glad that you did. So, so with that, uh, again, I apologize for the rockiness in the demo. Um, but uh, we did we did eventually get it working, and uh, I'm going to try to hand over control back to the administrators, and we can start handling some questions. Or actually, you know what? If if I can take them verbally, or if I can see them somehow, mm -hmm. maybe yeah. I can share my screen if I answer them. Yeah. Yes, but it will be easier if you have to demo anything. Okay. Just here yeah. you are, and um, I'll just read some some. Oh of yeah, them. we got a lot of them. Okay. I think. Yeah. But All right. Thank you so much, Jesse. Um, and I will be. We will be going through the questions uh, in just a moment. I'll start from the the top. Um, <clears throat> so let me just tell you very quickly that uh, this session has been recorded or is being recorded, and I'll make the replay and the materials available later on. Uh, and I will normally not notify you by email. So if you're on my mailing list, you'll get that. Otherwise, just send me an email. I'll send details on the chat in a minute. Um, we, I haven't got anything um, properly scheduled for the next few sessions just yet. I'm working on it and just about trying to confirm. So I will post details of that as soon as it's available. So um, let's go through some of the, the questions then. Um, okay. Um, there was a question right at the beginning to me privately. Um, when you were doing the connection um, via ACS um, and putting in your user ID and password, Jesse, is that secured? Uh, somebody's asking, is that port 992? Nope, that is not 992. That is actually SSH. So it, it is secured. It is encrypted. Um, it's not it's not any in the clear. So SSH is um, quite often accepted as just as secure as, as port 992 would be. Okay, thank you. Um, in our environment, we mostly work on JD on IBM I. So I, is there any RPM or API that's available or can we build it in order to generate graphs or make it smart device friendly? Yeah, the, the the short answer is absolutely yes. I mean, you literally have uh, hundreds of packages that can help you do visual kinds of things. Some of those are our client packages, um, you know, JS Fiddle or simple things like that, all the way up to React and Angular. Um, yeah, the, the short answer is yes. There's tons of packages that are working to do reactive web pages, uh, graphing, uh, even you know, image manipulation. Um, mobile device readiness. There's there's tons of packages available. A lot of those aren't available directly from IBM. They're just publicly available packages that you'd install and use with your language of choice, be it Node.js or PHP or whatever. And if, if you want uh, more advice on what you need to pursue, uh, I would say hop over to that River community that I've dropped the links for and start asking out there and you'll get a lot of good uh, opinions or insights. Thank you. I'll post the river uh, URL onto the wiki page as well under the replay section, so it's easy for people to find. Um, another question was, if you don't have, um, uh, if you can't uh, reach system Y SSH from ACS, is there an option to install? Is there another way to do this to a system that can't be reached via SSH? Um, yeah, that there. You will need SSH connectivity to use uh, any of this ACS open source package management stuff. Um, if you, um, you know, if you want to turn this off so that, you know, another common question might be if if you don't want people to be in here using this, be aware first off this requires all object authority. So if you have users without all object authority, they're not going to be able to come in and install open source and remove stuff and do updates. Um, the other thing to be aware of is, is, of course, in your ACS deployments, you can restrict this and block it and turn it off just like anything else, right? And, of course, you can block things on the server side from SSH as well. 
but is there a way to install these packages if you don't uh, use the ACS method, I yep. guess? Is, is there, there actually is. Um, so in the uh, presentation itself, I, I left a link for this short link for ibm.biz forward slash IBM IRPMs. And that gets you to a page that talks about three ways to get started, right? And the three ways are uh, use this ACS tool, which is what a very large percentage of our customers are doing. Um, the other way is actually you can just run some SQL, right? So if you have ACS run SQL scripts tool or any SQL tool, you actually can run uh, an SQL script and it'll, it'll get everything installed for you. Or if you have none of those tools, there's just basically this um, compressed file that you can install uh, manually, if you will. Just go run a couple commands and, and get it installed that way. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, there was another question about RPMs on IBM I. Are they big endian? Yep, it's all it's all big endian, and and it's all it's all actually built on IBM I big endian, targeting big endian I. Yep. Okay. Great. Um, there was a question about where they can get this presentation, but I've already covered that we will make that available. So I'll yep. send out an email. Uh, is Growl coming to IBM I? I don't know if you've heard Growl, um, probably at some point, but okay. I don't have any dates to share right now. Okay. Um, and is there a list of those simple SQLs that you could use to get to the system health statistics daily? Uh, I think this is referring to the time yep. when you're talking about those services. Yep. Um, those are out on developer works, which is now, yeah, I guess moved to IBM developer, so it's a little clunky, but uh, those are those are all out on developer works. So if you know Scott Forsey and his team, they, they maintain these pages that uh, talk about all the various things that you can do. They also mention, let me this over here a, bit, a little bit. Um, if you can see this on the screen, they, they show what the services are. Um, you can see what PTF level, what group level you need, um, you know, things like querying out job info for in information, querying out system status. If we look at that one, um, you get to documentation about what are all the various columns that you can get back from this. They also have usually at least one example, sometimes four or five examples of how do you use this, right? So this particular one, queries out system status, much like you'd get from, uh, say, a WorkSys status, right? Um, and you can do basically F5 versus F10 with this reset statistics thing. And so you can see the number of jobs and CPU usage and all that stuff um, just by a simple SQL. And I, I should add that Scott Forsty actually did deliver a session on this Power cool. series. So uh, if you look at the wiki and uh, head to the past replay section, um, there is a session. I, I can't remember the session number, but I'll look that up in a moment. Um, okay, thank you. Um, rational developer for I to supplement code coverage. Any unit test, any unit test frame works or planned or available for COBOL programmers? Um, I'm I'm going to deflect on that one. That's a better question for one of my uh, partners in crime, Tim Rowe. Okay. Uh, I do know that's something that they were looking at, but I, I honestly don't know what the status or plans there are. Okay. Um, and next one, what are the chances of getting Go on IBM I? It would be nice to have access to tools like FZE, uh, FZF, uh, and maybe alternative shells like ZSH or FISH. Yeah, so, so Go, um, at, at this point I can say we're, we're working on Go, actually. Uh, my team is, is working on Go. Um, I I can't obviously guarantee a delivery or a time frame, but that is something that we are actively working on. Um, in terms of alternative shells, um, Z shell or Z shell rather is um, probably likely to happen as well. That one um, that one's a pretty easy port. Fish we haven't gotten any requests for, but I, I'd love to hear your use cases for it. Um, but yeah, def definitely Z shell is is likely to happen. Okay. Thank you. Um, are there any plans to port the sub version server? There are AIX packages available from pearls.org 
but these are not compatible with PACE to my understanding. Correct. Yeah, they're, um, we're not actively working on that right now, but that is that is on the list, that is on our wish list. And I do know there are a couple community members as well looking at that. So uh, that might be another one that comes from a third party um, or it might come from us. But like I said, we're not actively working on those right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think the next question was to me privately about how to get these open source packages, but you've answered that already just recently. Another way, an alternative way to ACS. Um, okay, so how does uh, IBMI support DevOps? Sorry, how does IBMI support DevOps? Does it work with current tools like CARA? Oh, that should be a full stop there. So how does IBMI yep. support DevOps? Does it work with current tools like CARA? So, so um, CARA, I can't comment uh, in particular on. Um, obviously, it does support DevOps. Uh, many of you know that we have a partner, RCAD, who sells IBMI-based DevOps solutions on a daily basis. Um, a lot of the underlying technologies for supporting DevOps, of course, do work as well. So like, like I mentioned earlier, you know, we have, uh, we have Git, we have Jenkins. Um, those are often considered DevOps tools. Those are kind of some of the underpinnings for DevOps, in my opinion. Um, those are easily available, also easily supportable. <laughs> On IBMI, we have numerous other tools, whether we're talking Python, Ansible for CI, CD stuff. Um, um, like I said, all, a lot of the build tool chains that, that fall into the whole DevOps category. Um, I would say a lot of a lot of DevOps tools work. Um, there's a lot of industry standard tools that can be made to work with IBMI as well. So the short answer is yes. While we don't support every DevOps tool available, because DevOps tools is, is a very broad suite of tools, um, we do support a lot. And people have been doing DevOps on IBMI for years, um, and even more so with with some of the things that are are now working great. Thank you. I should uh, add that if uh, if anyone is in London uh, in March, March the 8th, we are running an IBM, IBM and RCAD joint breakfast meeting, breakfast briefing um, to, to cover exactly this topic, IBM I and DevOps. Mm -hmm. um, so um, join us that then. Uh, look out for my tweets on the subject or um, send me an email and I can provide some details. Um, Another comment, I guess, or question is, are we going to get GPUs for IBM I? I guess this is when you were talking about machine learning. The honest answer is I don't know at this point. Okay. I would love uh, to. Indeed. Uh, is Angular supported on IBM I? And if so, what version? I think it's. Yep, is Angular is, is, as far as I know, all versions of Angular up to and including the newest uh, LTS releases of Angular are are um, fully functional on IBM I and uh, community support is readily available for them. Mm -hmm. And Spring Boot supported? Yep, Spring Boot, same story. In fact, my last time I was in Europe, I. I uh, watched a presentation about someone deploying Spring Boot and doing some really cool stuff with it. So um, yeah, short answer, yes. Okay, great. Um, just last couple of uh, questions. Uh, do you need to change the path environment variable to use the packages? Do you know? Spectacular question. So that's one of the, I'm, I'm glad you asked, by the way, that's one of the biggest um, gotchas with these open source packages is that they install to a different location. So they don't conflict with any AIX binaries you may have installed or anything like that. They install to a, a place over in QOpenSys packages is the directory. And if I were go to go back to this page about installing uh, RPMs, this is just on that IBM.biz uh, short link that's in the presentation. There's this must know usage notes, read this after you install. And it talks about um, setting the environment with this uh, new directory in your path to get rolling, because that is a very, very common problem that people run into. Um, the other thing as well, uh, in this repository, so this, this repository itself is actually, um, it's open source. <laughs> and so 
if you have anything you'd like to add to this documentation, you can contribute it. You can either send us a pull request if you're um, familiar with doing that, or you can open an issue and, and suggest changes, and we'll actually, uh, um, you know, and many times make those changes for you. We also have a troubleshooting page, um, which is common open source problems and how to fix them, right? And so this is similar uh, types of things where you try to run stuff and you get command not founds and it talks about we have a page on setting your path and so on. So hopefully the doc documentation can get you there if you're having any issues with the path environment variable. Um, but again, if not, anybody can submit issues to this guy and, and maintain it. It's kind of community maintained, but IBM endorsed uh, documentation for this stuff. That's great, thank you. Um, Django with DB2 on I, does that work with Python 3 IBM dash DB? Uh, yes, it does. Um, if you're familiar with Django, there's there's a package called IBM underscore DB underscore Django that you get when you when you install the IBM DB package, and you can use that with DB2 on I. Okay, that's it for today um, in terms of questions. So what I suggest is we stop the recording and stay on for a couple more minutes, if that's okay, Jesse. Absolutely. I just wanted to say thank you so much for covering all that, uh, all the details, and uh, we will post the replay up soon. And, and thanks for everybody who's attending and listening and, and hearing the message. I, I appreciate everybody who's here supporting your user group. Great, thank you.